Good morning, beloved. Nice to see you all. The Pastoral Illustration Committee, uh, it's a committee of one, by the way, um, asked me this morning to help with some quality control measures that they're trying to implement. And so we're going to conduct a little straw poll this morning to see where the congregation is. So um, if, if you regularly watch or are interested in the NBA, can you raise your hand? Raise it high. Okay, I was hoping for less turnout. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, however, uh, if you have ever read or seen or are interested in or have heard of Lord of the Rings, raise your hand. Raise them high. That's right. I knew that I could depend on this highfalutin congregation. So, um, where is Bob today? No one really knows. It does, however, coincide today with Game 2 of the NBA Finals. So, um, no, I'm, Bob is off doing the Lord's work and, and doing good. Um, I'm always um, astounded when I think about his work that he does because, of course, I've been working so hard on this thing, and um, my week is just shot, and it's so difficult, and I just think, how could one do this week after week? So next time you see him, thank him, because it's really hard. Um, he's, he's pretty good at it, but it's hard nonetheless. Um, so I'm not taking you to game two uh, or to the NBA, but we are going to journey to Middle Earth this morning. So if you'll um, sort of uh, stay with me, I think that I can make it helpful. Um, if you know anything about uh, the book, uh, Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth is where Lord of the Rings takes place. It's a journey. Uh, it's, it's a story about a journey that a lot of people take. Um, several of these people, perhaps the most important ones, are hobbits. They are little people, sort of. Um, that's a way to think about it. Um, they're not typically what you would think of as warrior types, although they end up being more so. Um, but uh, So they start off on this journey to destroy this ring and uh, this, this evil ring of power. And they're not far on their journey, um, and, I mean, they've been chased by these crazy dragon things and just beleaguered on all sides by evil forces. And so they get, uh, like I said, they get a few steps in the journey, uh, and they're waiting um, at, this, at this pub, at this hotel, um, where they're going to stay the night. And, uh, and they're very, very scared, and they don't know, really know what to expect. Um, and while they're there... They see this man sitting in the corner. He uh, looks sinister. Uh, he has sort of a hood over, him, over his head. And they don't know who it is. And they're frightened because, like I said, they're far from home and they don't really know what to expect. But they, um, so they go and they, um, there's, a, there's a letter actually waiting for them there at the pub. And, uh, and the letter um, is, is addressed to the hobbits. And it tells them that along the way, they may find a friend, and it won't be a, f a friend like they're looking for. It wouldn't be what they're going to expect. And uh, the guy who wrote the letter, his name's Gandalf. He's a wizard, and as wizards are wont to do, he quotes a poem in the letter, an old poem, to explain who it is that they would meet. And this poem begins with, All that is gold does not glitter, and all who wonder are not lost. And so when they read that poem, they realize well, of course, we weren't expecting the guy, the crazy guy in the corner who's smoking his pipe and has this cloak over himself, this really intimidating guy. But as it turns out, um, this guy's name is Strider, um, that Strider is uh, exactly what they were looking for. And um, so, but he wasn't really what they were expecting. All that, again, we typically think all that glitters is not gold, but in this case, it was all that is gold does not glitter. There is actually something precious that may look different than what you're looking for. Um, and so I think that, and actually, if you were to kind of march through Lord of the Rings, you would see that over and over and over again. And as it turns out, if you were to march through the Bible, you would see that over and over and over again, this theme running through the Bible of um, when, you're, when you're looking for the obvious, when you're looking for the thing that makes sense, when you're looking for the precious, when you're looking for the diamond that looks like the diamond, you miss it. And yet over and over again, the things that you don't think of being precious, the things that, that don't look like they would be the most valuable end up being that way. Um, and I think that's exactly what we see today um, with our text. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7. 
verses 13 and 14, uh, really famous verses, the wide and the narrow gate. And there we see that, like so often in the Bible, things are not as they appear. And so you have, there in 713, you have this narrow gate, this confining gate, this restrictive gate, and yet we're told that it leads to life, to spaciousness. You could probably think of it that way, to glory, to grandeur. And yet we're told the broad way, the way that it would look good, that would look enticing, the obvious way, the intuitive way, it leads to destruction. And um, so what we want to do is, as we're thinking about that, is ask ourselves three questions. There's so many things that we could do here, but I think most helpful for us where we are reading this today are these three questions. What is the narrow way? Why does the narrow way lead to life? And how do we walk by the narrow way? So I'm going to read the text again. This is Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14. If you'll uh, follow along with me. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Um, Pray with me. Father in heaven, we are so thankful to you and dependent upon you for the good gift that you gave us in your son who came to this earth and sat down on the mountain in the place of Moses to give a new law and in one sense father you gave us the gift of a law far far more difficult than the one that was given by Moses that we could never achieve and yet you gave us a different giver the one who gives this law comes to fulfill the law himself And to the degree that we trust in him and devote in him and and um, alter the posture of our hearts toward him, we will be rewarded, even though that is a difficult way, that is a hard way. We will be rewarded not only with blessings in this life, but with infinite blessings in the life to come. And all of that has nothing to do with us that has everything to do with you and your goodness, your mercy, um, and your glory. And Father, convict us today of reading the Bible incorrectly. Convict us of our righteousness. And Lord, give us the, um, make your spirit impress upon us the importance of forsaking not only our sin, but forsaking our good works too. Thank you, Father. Protect us from the evil one. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so, uh, so the first question is, what is the narrow way? Now, the word narrow is sort of, I think of it kind of as an inflammatory word for a lot of different people, kind of like the word evolution. You know, there's nobody who's like, I don't really, I don't really have a dog in that fight. I mean, you're, you know, you typically, when you hear the word evolution, there are strong things that you think of either for or against or the word racist or something, where nobody just yawns when that word is mentioned. I mean, it evokes emotion, and narrow is sort of that way to me, too. If you tend to be a little young-ish, then um, don't call me narrow. Um, You can can call me anything, but, but, and, and really probably most of us are that way, is that we tend to think of narrowness in a negative light. Um, that uh, we do not want to be seen as unsophisticated or as, uh, as, as, you know, that we can't understand other things. We don't want to be seen as intolerant. And so narrow is, um, is in some ways, rightly offensive to us. But then, um, on the other hand, there are many of, probably some of us, but certainly in the sort of larger Christian culture, for whom narrowness is a badge of honor, like, Let me draw whatever line in the sand that I can. And when I do, the harder that I stand there, no matter how ridiculous the line is, the better I am off with God. And 
And then there's the reality that who was the narrowest of all? The Lord Jesus Christ himself. When we are narrow, folks, we get it honest. I mean, he over and over again himself drew the line and said, you're either with me or against me. Many are called, few are chosen. Um, some are excluded. There's a, especially in Matthew, a lot of insider, outsider, inclusive, exclusive language. And so um, this narrowness thing, really, we really need to deal with it um, and, and figure out, because we can, uh, we can mess this up and I think just completely blow these verses. Um, and I think what we want to do today maybe is to almost is to relearn these verses I think and this I have to be very very careful because um, I'm a young guy and as young people are want to do I want to come in and tell you everything that you don't know and relearn your stuff um, and that is very scary to me to, to do that. And yet I have a responsibility for us to consider every time that we come to the Bible for us to consider what we have in front of us afresh. And the way that I've always understood these verses and the way that they've been taught to me in the past and maybe the way that you maybe have taught them or understood them yourselves, I think largely misses the point. And so we've got to be really careful about what we do here. And sort of the typical interpretation, and you've probably seen posters, you know, showing this is the, uh, uh, in verses 7, um, or chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, you have the, the broad way, which is, you know, there are brothels and people gambling and spending their money loosely and doing all these crazy things. And, you know, because that's the easy way, that's the easy, you know, you uh, go to bed late and get up late and you don't go to work and, and, uh, and you're all about money and all those sort of things. And so, and, and that way is easy. And that way, eventually, although fun today, leads to destruction. But then on the other side, you have the narrow way where you're really exercising your discipline. You know, you're reading your Bible every morning and you're praying. And there aren't many people that can do that. There aren't many people who have the discipline, the fortitude, to make it on that road. And so those that do have that discipline and are good are eventually rewarded for that. And there aren't that many of them. Um, the problem with that is it's completely out of sync, not only with all of Scripture, but it is antithetical to the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount actually, I would argue and will, that it systematically uh, dismantles that type of reading of chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. So, um, I, it, um, I don't want to just leave it there. I'd like to prove that to you. And so what I want to do is kind of look at the sermon kind of from the big picture. Um, when we get to chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, we actually come to the end of the sermon proper. The sermon ends at verse 12 with the golden rule. And then um, chapter, or, uh, verses 13 and 14 actually start the sort of application section, the conclusion section. And it's really, uh, Jesus was so good to us to give us uh, verses 13 through the end of the chapter. That way we don't have to wonder about how to interpret the sermon. In fact, most good sermons, uh, hopefully this one, will not leave things um, undone. That, that, you, that you lay down the truth and then you tell people what to do with that and that's what Jesus is doing and in Jesus graciousness what he's doing is he's given examples for all variety of people so maybe if you're a traveler then wide gate and the narrow gate is obvious to you you know that makes sense to you or maybe you're a teacher and so false teacher versus a genuine teacher or a good teacher is it makes sense to you or maybe you're a farmer in the ancient near east and so you understand good fruit and bad fruit or maybe you're a builder, and you can really, it really resonates with you building a house on the rock versus a house on the sand. So what Jesus does there is he, is he really belabors the point and says things over and over again um, to different types of people in different, in, in, in different ways to really hammer home this one point, and I think that it's the point that runs all the way from chapter 5, verse 1, up through 7, 12 at the end of the sermon. And that is, there are two alternative ways to live. It's everywhere in the sermon. 
And I think that we could probably get that from uh, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. There are two alternative ways to live. But unfortunately, what we typically do, because it's easier and because it's obvious, and it's a surfacey kind of level of a way to read chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, is that we say that it is good versus bad. It is good people versus bad people. That, the, again, the broad way is this loose way of living where you do whatever you want, and it looks great for a time, and then, and then you're going to pay. But then over here, those people who are quietly reading their Bible and suffering in this life, but they'll get theirs when we get to heaven. Um, again, that, that is not a, I don't think, and I don't think Jesus thinks either, that's not a helpful way to, to, to read the sermon, so we've got to relearn it. Um, and for the, in order to show that, I would like to point to a couple different places in the sermon itself. Um, let's, so let's go to, you can follow along if you'd like, uh, chapter 5, verse 20, where um, Jesus I'm going to back up a little bit, where he says, I do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Um, And he says that he's actually not come to abolish the law, but he's going to fulfill the law. Uh, I wish that we had hours to unpack these verses, because this is wonderful. The Sermon on the Mount, you can't get enough of it. It's so rich. But we don't. uh, so, So go down to verse 20, and he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So that, we've heard that. We may have our gloss on that. We may think we understand that. But you've got to remember that the people who are hearing this. So Jesus is actually, is, is I, he's, there's real, probably two groups of people there. There are the Pharisees, and there are the people who think the Pharisees are great, or the people who want to aspire, who are aspired to be the Pharisees. Um, the pagans aren't there that day. The pagans are in Corinth or Rome or wherever they were waiting for Paul to come along and, and, and tell them what they need to know. But these people actually didn't need to be told to be good. They thought they were being good. They thought they were good. They wanted to be good. They, were, um, um, they, they, they thought that they were doing the right thing, and even if they didn't think they were doing the right thing, they really wanted to. Um, and so that... So, uh, in that way, then, um, telling them that their righteousness has to exceed the scribes and the Pharisees, at some level, is, is either absurd, because it's impossible. These people were fastidious about righteousness in a way that we can't, we don't even have a category in our minds for this. I mean, it, that, that ship sailed in the 15th century. There's nobody alive who can be as good as the Pharisees. I don't know. I just made that up. But I mean, but you know, you get the point. Is that, I mean, these people were just unparalleled in their commitment to every jot and tittle of the law. But, um, and so that is, like I said, either absurd or it's very, very bad news. Um, It's very, very bad news to a person who is a tax collector or a fisherman or a farmer or whatever that their righteousness has to exceed the scribes and the pharisees because there's no way so when we look at that we see that so all these people here these are not you don't have a crowd full of good people and bad people and jesus is saying um, you good people are doing the right thing uh, but you bad people you really need to get on the good side Instead, he's drawn this line, this, the fork in the road, the alternative ways to live. Is He's saying there's actually two ways to be good. Because you're all good, or you think you're good. You all think that good is good. Um, you're the type of people who think uh, who, who would be good. Um, but that uh, there are actually two ways to be religious. And you are blowing it. You have missed it. Because the way that you are understand what it means to be religious, what it means to relate to God, is to do outward works, to manifest, to um, to present yourself to others as holier than you are. Um, whereas um, the true way to be religious is to have an inward transformation. So let's go. Um, so I think we see that there. And again, we've got to remember the, the, the people that he's talking to. And then, to make the point even clearer, in, in what's probably one of the most famous passages, uh, famous passage in, in the Bible, certainly in the Sermon on the Mount, where he comes and he has this kind of formulaic 
way that he kind of runs through all these things in the law. So you have heard it said, uh, do not kill. I say that if you have anger in your heart, then you're just as bad. You have heard it said, do not divorce, but, uh, you know, uh, unless you have a certificate. But I say to you that anybody that does except for adultery is, you know, um, will not inherit the kingdom. So all these things where Jesus really is, he's ratcheting up what it takes to get into the kingdom so tight that it, I mean, th- that he's excluding everyone. And I think that's what he's doing intentionally. Well, he's really, he's doing that. He's excluding people. He's, he's, he's saying you can't play the Pharisee game and get in, but he's also driving them back to, because each of these things that they do is, he, he's, he's drawing a distinction between an outward manifestation of righteousness and an inward manifestation of righteousness. And that's exactly, that's what we see all through chapter 5, and that's what we see whenever we get to chapter 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And so, again, the focus is on cultivating an inner transformation of, 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 of heart, of actually loving righteousness, not because people see you doing it, but because it's the right thing to do and because it pleases God. Not, not manipulating God into being pleased because, you know, you want his favors, but in or, just because it makes him happy. That is the narrow way. And I think that is, like I said, it's woven throughout chapters um, 5 through 7 is, is that there are two ways, there are two ways to live. Um, not good versus bad here. Of course, we see that in other places. Read 1 Corinthians, you will see that there are people that need to be told that they need to act right. But not these people. Um, Jesus was saying, you are acting right for the wrong reason. You should act right. But your acting right should be a transformed posture of your heart and who you are based upon what God has done for you. So that's the narrow way. Um, Number two, how does the narrow way lead to life? Um, Now, again, I don't want to beat up on everything that we know or everything that we may have been taught in the past. There is an element of truth in the fact that um, the narrow way does lead to life, and we could think of that way as being heaven. But I don't really think that that's exactly what's going on here. Of course, heaven, we could equate heaven with life. But I think really what's going on here is, um, is blessing. Uh, of course, we see that where? In the Beatitudes, where there is, there is a different way to approach the world, a different mode of heart that gives you blessing even when you're enduring persecution. Um, so I think what we see is, is uh, this narrowness that even in this life leads to, to life, to spaciousness, to breadth. Um, and to illustrate that, I want to again go to um, what I consider to be one of the literary pillars of uh, really probably of the Western canon. And uh, Megan, if you can go ahead and put this up. So this is a Peanuts cartoon, I think it was, I mean, it's pretty primitive, so this is in the 50s, I think, not that everything in the 50s is primitive, but this is. All right, so Peanuts, so, okay, so we're going to kind of march through this, and I think it'll be helpful. So Charlie Brown, what in the world is going on over there? And then one of the characters calls in, and then Charlie Brown is, um, as he is wont to do, confused and scratching his head. He doesn't understand how they're fitting in Snoopy's house, because Snoopy's house is Bigger than an average Beagle's house, but uh, certainly not big enough for, uh, for a whole bunch of people. So he's confused, and then, uh, then the girl goes in, and then everybody's in, um, and then Snoopy goes in, and Charlie Brown is confused again. And then he says, hey, is there room for, for, for one more? And they say, well, sure, come on in. Uh, the house itself isn't so big, but you ought to see the recreation room. <laughs> so, folks, if that's not funny to you your funny analysis meter is off. No. Um, so, but that really is, um, when we look at that paradox of Jesus calling us to this narrow way, and narrowness being something that, it's not like our, uh, narrow is not 
distasteful only to us. I mean, people have never liked to be narrow. There's nothing that's fun about getting squished. I mean, this is, this is not fun to any culture. Um, and so for, for, this, for Jesus to, to associate narrowness with life, is interesting, and I think that it's going gonna, it's gonna to look exactly like that, where you have this sort of narrow gate, you have this narrow place that you're going to, and then, uh, and you're not headed there necessarily because you think that there's a lavish recreation room in the doghouse, but when you get there, you know, you walk in the doghouse or you open up the blinds or, or whatever, and it's a banquet hall. Um, and that's exactly what um, I think, that's, that's probably a good way to think about the Christian life. But all right, so um, how, how does the narrow way w- lead to life? I think there's two things that we need to look at here, and uh, and the, those two things are that there is this this way that it leads to like a, a horizontal blessing, which should be like um, all of us together. Um, it it transforms human relationships, and it I mean it fundamentally changes them when we say. I'm not going to do right things because they impress people. I'm going to do right things because my heart's different. That will radically transform every level of society from top to bottom. And then there's the vertical. It also transforms the way that we interact with God. So let's think about how it would interact or how that it would transform our own um, interactions with each other. So think, and I've had toyed with reading the entire Sermon on the Mount before starting, and I really probably should have. But I decided not to. Um, but I trust that you're familiar enough uh, with it to to think back on all the lofty, wonderful things that are there. All the ways that you think, man, why can't it be that way? Um, like for instance, um, and 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 why do we? Why can't it be that way? Why do we have to rely on the law? Either the law that says that you have to impress people, which is a law that is written in people's hearts, or, the, or like a civic law, a government law. Why do we have to depend on those things? Why can't we just have transformed hearts and love each other? Um, so, like, for instance, um, at work, um, what if, like in 533 and, and going forward from there, what if when you went to work, you, both you and your boss were completely sure that your yes was yes and your no was no? Can you imagine how wonderful that would be to have that kind of relationship where you just go and you enjoy work and your and your boss trusts everything that you do and there's never that that distrust. I mean that's just um what a way to live. It's just transforming. Um what about family? Typically we think of, you know, um you know, 50-50, you know, like everybody um if I'm wrong, you know, I'm going to hold that against somebody. But um but instead, we're told in the Sermon on the Mount that even th- that we should do whatever we can to be reconciled to our brother or sister. What a way to live, to not wait on that person, but to instead, um, when you feel wronged, go seek somebody out and be reconciled. I, you know, there are important wars that have been fought in history that could have been you know, avoided with something as simple as that. Um, leaders, what if... What if leader, people who lead you, if whether or not it's government or church or whatever, what if they really understood meekness and they knew that power is really supposed to be used to protect the weak, that that's really when you're the most powerful, that, 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 you should, that it's, power is not to be pooled and, 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 and used to serve um, a leader's own um, devices or his own good or her good, but instead, power is, is supposed to be to protect the people that can't protect themselves. What if leaders really bought into that? It's a tr- I mean, it would be, like I said, a transforming reality. Or, um, and I mean, you could go through as many examples as you like, but I mean, a couple. Um, 548, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Uh, one way to think about perfect would be complete or whole um, integrity. What if what if everything that we did that we thought is, you know, am I consistent with is what I'm doing consistent with who God is from top to bottom, just transforming. Um, and that would be wonderful. And the degree to which we do that, um, I mean, I, I don't I don't want. To, ah, there's this part about the Sermon on the Mount where you don't. I don't want to be naive. And say that that well, we should all just love each other, but there's also this um, 
a, a reality that while we're here, the degree to which that we understand, appreciate, and are inspired by the Beatitudes and the rest of the sermon and um, alter our posture of heart towards God is the degree to which we are blessed is clear. I mean, is just, it is, is clear throughout 5 through 7 that there are blessings that follow being pure in heart, being meek, being peacemakers, being all the things that the world thinks are absurd. Um, and they will have um, genuine ramifications for the way that we interact with each other, for the way that married people interact with each other, for the way that parents interact with their kids and kids interact with their parents. And um, this world will never be perfect. It's not even going to be close, but we can help when we are gripped by this alternate way to think about um, how that we relate to God and, and really changing our heart from the inside out. Um, but probably even more important than that, how does this different way to think about life, this alternative way, how does it alter our relationship with God? And to illustrate this point, I want to take you back to what is probably the darkest time in my adult life. Um, really kind of a shadow, walking through the valley of the shadow of death type time. And that is, I mean, you can probably guess it, second semester of law school when grades come out. So, I mean, just this, everything depends on these grades and you just want to do so well and you don't do as well as you think. And then you're, you know, indignant about your grade, but that's a whole other story. Uh, but, but your grades are so important because that's all that you have to base your, uh, your merit with firms on, and then firms come on campus, and, and they're looking for the certain grade point averages, and if you have them, you're in. If you don't have them, you're out. So, like, if a firm says our cutoff is a 3.25, and you've got a 3.23, then as far as that firm's concerned, you may not have even showed up to class because you're out. And when you really think about the way that we usually think about uh, seven, uh, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 with the wide and the narrow gate, or the way that every single way of life besides grace-based biblical Christianity thinks about the world, is that God has this cutoff. He's got this GPA mark. It may be a 3.25, a 3.0. Some people think it's a 2.0. Uh, but wherever it is, there, are, there would be people who miss it by what? They didn't study, they, if they had studied another 30 minutes for their torts test, they would have made the cut? Well, think about living like that. If, it, if, if you really make it on your works, if that's really the way that you interact with God, that is a terrible way to live. Wondering, gosh, I didn't stop at that stop sign. Is, that's what, is that what's going to keep me out of heaven? Is that, is that why God won't love me? I mean, think about that, um, and that is, that is how that you that is how that thinking about narrow and broad, thinking about getting um, making our way with God. If it is based on performance, then what happens is is that this broad way that where people think, oh, you can um, you know do whatever you want, or this broad way in terms of I don't really want to you know um, I don't really want to do the Jesus thing. Uh, that broad way as it turns out, turns into slavery, to shackles, the shackles of never really knowing if you're good enough. So just like, um, just like it was with that GPA thing, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a, you know, what is the difference between making it and not making it? How can one know? What a terrible, terrible way to live. Um, and it, like I said, it ends up being not as broad as, as it's presented to be. But on the other hand, there's real freedom in taking the narrow way, in knowing that your performance, whether good or bad, is not what um, earns is is not how that God sees you. Um, and so um, that that ha that has to inform our the way that we see seven, thirteen, and fourteen. And so what we see is is this, and I'm not going to go off on this, but I really would like to. It, but what we see there is as we reject self-righteousness and as we embrace what the Sermon on the Mount is painting, this beautiful picture of a changed heart towards God, not based on, on outward appearances, 
but instead on our, our love for and devotion to him. What you see is, in some real sense, both horizontal and vertical shalom, peace. That there is this, there's a fabric that we have together, and there is there, and we are also knit together with God. And um, when you really understand your place, and you start loving people, not because of the way that it looks, but you love people, um, and you treat each other like the Sermon on the Mount would, would, is calling us to treat each other, based just upon a transformed heart, you have true peace. Peace here, amongst ourselves, amongst people, and peace with God. And that is life. And it, so it is um, much like Snoopy's house, that this, this, this gate, the, this way that looks narrow, in fact it is narrow, it is based on one person, it, it, it is singular on Jesus Christ. But once you take that road, you see that that is a road of, of, of riches, of blessing, of, of wealth, of, 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 of wonderful interactions with people, and peace with God. And no, not sitting around wondering, um, again, whether or not you shouldn't have jaywalked because you're going to go to hell, which I think must be the natural outworking of you know, any situation where it's dependent upon you. And people may not think about that. And you may not think about that if if you don't, if you're not a Christian. But um, it is a no way to live when you don't have to. Um. So. Um. So we've looked at what is the narrow way, and then we've looked at how does a narrow way lead to life, and lastly we're going to look at how it is that we can act, actually take the narrow path. What it, how can we implement this changed posture of heart based upon our n- new looking at God afresh? And I'm going to share with you, somewhat against my better judgment, but I think it's going to be uh, I think it's going to be helpful. Um, a recent experience of mine, and um, I share this because I think that. This is not a tried example of sin and idolatry and self-righteousness, but um, it is probably not as glaring as maybe what you would usually think. Um, but we're, most of us are knowledgeable enough about the Bible, theologically sophisticated enough, where most of the battles that we're going to fight are going to be quiet. They're going to be subtle. They're not going to be clear to other people. Um, they are going to be um, um, a, a little bit smaller battles, if, if that makes sense. And so I'm sharing this, this with you because I think it, it just really illustrates this point. So, um, and, but the thing is that both me and you, because we're there, because we do have a pretty decent knowledge about the Bible and we kind of know what's going on, what do we struggle with? And who can we be in about 12 seconds if given the right conditions? Pharisees. Um, they were the good guys. They were the conservatives. They were the people that held the line. They were the people that thought that they were doing the right thing. And even though they completely blew it, they are us. And we are perilously close to them at all times because we know what's up. We're on, and any time you're on the inside, theologically, you are in a perilous position. Now, we stay on the inside, but, I mean, we are at, at, at war. It, con- we, it requires constant vigilance for us not to fall in to exactly the error that these people were making in Matthew. So, uh, so this, is the, this is the thing. Some of you uh, may know this, depending on how well you know me, but uh, I am not what you would describe as a task-oriented person. I know it, I mean, you're like, how in the world? No, uh, I, I mean, I love to meet new people. I'm kind of an ideas man, or that's how I fancy myself anyway. I mean, I just love the big picture and love to think about new creative things. When it comes to get, actually getting stuff done, I hate it. Well, actually, I, I, li- I mean, I, I'm inclined to the idea of it, but it just never, <laughs> but it just never happens. Um, and so, like, I mean, I'm not going to go into a lot of examples, but, I mean, it could very well be that Carmen could come in and say, Stefan, I would really like it if you were to wash the dishes. And then she would come back, and I would have prepared maybe a new recipe for a countertop cleaner or a spreadsheet, you know, that lays out how we're going to divvy up uh, our responsibilities for the next three or four years. 
or something like that. I just like to think, and I like to plan, I like to think in these big ways, but when it comes down to getting stuff done, um, I get stuff done, but I ain't the best at it. So um, this has never really been a problem because being in school is not that hard. Most of my jobs, I haven't really had any responsibility, but now that I'm out of school, and uh, and I'm and I'm just I'm trying to uh, I mean I have a, a law practice that I largely run myself and so it's pretty important that I be task oriented because you can't dream a pleading to be drafted somebody's got to draft it uh, I could give it to my girl but I ain't got no girl so it's me <laughs> so um, um, so over the last several months what what has happened is is that I've grown sort of increasingly frustrated because or I grew increasingly frustrated because I just, it's not really what I wanted to do. I wanted to think, I wanted to plan, I wanted to blog, I wanted to think of neat neat things to do, but I just wasn't super, super task-oriented. And so that's a problem. That's probably, there's an idolatry there. I'm not really sure what it is. Probably an idol is comfort. Maybe an idol is dreaming. I don't know if dreaming can be an idol. I really haven't got down to the bottom of it, but I recognize that there was a problem that there was a fork in the road, and I could choose one of two ways. And there's one way where I could have gone to God with open hands and said, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to fix this. I don't like doing work. No, not really, but I don't like doing small stuff. I can't get this stuff done. Help me, because I'm worried. I'm anxious. Uh, I, I don't know what to do, Lord. Change my heart. And there was this other way that was like, well, I'm going to read some books and I'm going to read some blogs and I'm going to make another spreadsheet and I'm going to come up with, um, I'm going to, you know, come up with, I think the jacket's too tight with this thing over here. So I probably need more margin on. Anyway, I don't know why that came up. Anyways, not to distract you from uh, where we're going with this. But so that was the road that I choose, that I chose is to, uh, is to say, I'm going to gird up my loins and I'm going to beat this. I'm going to, I'm going to do better. I'm going to start being task-oriented. And I'm going to read these books and do everything that I can, all these elaborate plans. And actually, as it, as it turned out, I have started really knocking it out of the park at work. And I was much better at it. And I was task-oriented. And I was getting all these things done. And I would check those things off. And I was just killing it. And um, But what happened was I... Um, I really had chosen the broad path. I had said, I'm not concerned about altering my posture towards you, Lord. I'm not concerned about really what's going on here. I just want to fix the problem. And I, and I can do it myself. And so what happened is, is that I had, I had fixed the, well, I hadn't fixed the problem. I had fixed, fixed the symptoms. But what happened is, is that I noticed that, um, that I was, um, when I came home, I was stern with Carmen. I was harsh. I was short. And that really started affecting a lot of my relationships. I didn't sleep as well. I didn't do... I just really... Um, in, 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 when you look at the whole person, I was really not really doing well um, several, you know, a couple months ago. And what had happened is, is that I had, in that, small, in that relatively small thing of how to start doing better about tasks or whatever is that I had, I, had, I had allowed my heart to grow cold to the gospel and to what the, what the gospel could do for me in that. And what happens is, is when you do that, your, heart is, um, your heart's not real precise. Um, once it starts growing cold on one thing, it can grow cold on other things. And that's exactly what was happening. Is my heart was, um, because of this, because I was the taskmaster to myself without any grace, for, without, I- without looking to God's grace, for, to, to help me is that it was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. And I was, I mean, the person I love the most in the world, I, I mean, I, it, it, it was just, it was ruining our relationship. And it, and it really it hurt a lot of aspects of life. Um, and and it, at work, I no longer longed to have new clients um, because I just saw them as a task list. You know, they weren't people that I could help. I didn't, I didn't love to, to think about the law. You know, it was drudgery. It was, you know, um, it, it, it just it just wasn't fun anymore, and I th- I think all of that is tied to the um, the condition of my heart because I had taken the broad way, and you know I had taken the easy way, I had taken the obvious way, the intuitive way, I had taken the way that every person would take you tell you to take, read a book, fix it, 
put things together, you know, put your life in order or whatever. Um, I had done all those things, and I and it was ruining. It was drawing my heart away from the Lord. I had really I had fixed the problem, but I had created one that's a lot worse. Um, my heart wasn't there, um, and and what I had done probably is a way to think about it is that I had met the problem of sin in my life, that idolatry, with the law. I had an issue, and I said, the law can fix it. But what happened is, is that the law, rather than being water to extinguish the fire, was like sprinkling gasoline on the fire. And so then I couldn't even tell what was wrong. I couldn't tell where my idolatry lay because it was, like I said, it was hardening every aspect of certainly my practice, but even my relationship with my wife. And I couldn't even tell anymore. What I had done is, another way to think about it, is that I had taken an aspirin, and which cured the headache that was caused by a brain tumor or something like that, where it just, I was dying inside. Uh, or and it certainly had that been allowed to persist, it would have been uh, horrific. But um, but thankfully, um, I, I I have repented of that, and I have have tried to um, say again, you know, with open hands, say, Lord, help me. I don't want to be anxious. I don't want to worry. Um, you know, being a child of yours is not a task list. Thankfully. Um, but it's funny that what I repented of, my real issue, was not my sin. I wasn't primarily repenting of my sin. I was repenting of my righteousness. What was wrong with me is that I was doing well. Is that, and of course, the fact that I did that, I mean, all of what I did in the first place was tied to my sin. But the thing that kept me away from God was not my sin, because God says, bring it to me. I'll deal with it. I dealt with it on the cross. I can handle this. Bring your sin to me. Bring your heart. Bring all of it. Bring your whole person. Be perfect. Come to me, all of you. I don't want just a part. Uh, he can handle the sin, but what he can't handle, and what he will not handle, and he will put his hand up when you come to him thinking that you can fix it yourself, coming with righteousness. And I think that's exactly what's going on here in chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 with the broad gate and the narrow gate you don't you can bust that narrow gate wide open bring in all of your sin god's going to work on you and you're going to start losing it. it's going to start falling off over time but but you come with your sin but you will not ever enter that narrow gate you will be excluded you will never even see it to the degree to which that you think that you can make it on your own. And that's why the Pharisees never saw it. It's why they lived their life in the Bible and they could never see that they had missed it. That they had completely missed the point of the, of the, of the books that they had memorized is because they, um, is because that they thought that they were okay. Uh, and that is the, as probably Tim Keller would say, that is the default mode of the human heart. That's where we're going to go back to when we're scared or when we're not um, when we're not focused and we're not depending on God, we're going we're gonna to default back to that. And the degree to which we do that is the degree to which that we are on the broad way. And that is the, that is the way that in the short term will lead to destruction. And in the long term, um, I think we have to look at you know, Matthew as a whole and say that that will lead to hell. Uh, I think that that's clear. So... Um, as we think about that um, as we, and as we prepare to come to the Lord's table you know you think about of all the things that Jesus could have left us with in order to remember him in order to commune with him in order to cultivate this sort of ongoing relationship with him uh, he could have left manuals he could have left uh, task lists he could have left guidebooks. He could have left all these things that, that, that explain every aspect of life or that um, tell us exactly when he's coming back. Of all the things that he could have left us with, he left us with the tools to commune with him because Jesus does not want winners. He doesn't want people who are knocking out of the park. He wants friends, friends who sit around a table together and love each other and bear their heart towards each other and don't 
try to look better than they are. And that is what we, that, and, and, and we are in a real sense um, doing that when we commune with him through the elements, through the bread and the fruit of the vine. Uh, that, uh, that, 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 and, and you come wrongly if you come thinking that you can look better than you are or that when you come to that meal that you need to clean yourself up. Um, or that, that righteousness is getting you anywhere at that meal. No, that gets you excluded from the meal. But when you come, you come only with a heart saying, I want to be your friend, warts and all. That I, I love you, and I, I'm, um, I have been transformed by this relationship that I have with you, Lord Jesus. And uh, I'll never be perfect. I'm going to try to do the best I can. I want to look more and more like you. But as for looking good on the outside, looking good to other people, that's foolishness. That's how you come to the table. So, and the hard, uh, another reality that I want to uh, emphasize quickly before we get to that is that if, if, you're, re- if you're not prepared to the come to table on those terms, then you haven't really come to the table on Jesus' terms. So, um, if you, but if you're a, a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've trusted in him, then um, I would Uh, not only welcome you, but I would um, joyously invite you to say, come down and and enjoy this meal among friends, here and here, towards Jesus and and among us when we come together. But if you have not done that, if uh, if you're holding on to your righteousness, if you think you can get somewhere with God, then um, you're actually not invited to, to the table, not because Jesus doesn't want you there. He wants to be your friend. You're the one holding it up because you're holding on to your righteousness and because you think you can get somewhere with God and you cannot be Jesus' friend when you do that. So um, we are going to sing a song and then just come down the outer aisles and then as you get done, go up the middle. So.
beloved, um, on the night before Jesus was to be crucified, he gathered with his friends, with those who had loved him and had um, demonstrated to him um, a lot of junk, but um, they loved him, and he loved them. And uh, just like those of us gathered um, who have trusted in him, that, that we really sit at that table as, as friends um, who are united in something a lot more important and special than um, the degree to which we do the right thing. But this is a, a communion with a friend. It is other things, but it is, at, it is uh, certainly a communion with a friend. And so think about that when you, when you take that, um, um, this bread that represents his body broken the, the very next day, broken for you as a friend. And in the same way, uh, blood, or uh, wine that represents his blood that, were, that was to be shed the very next day for his friends, for those who he was united to in, in friendship and in love and in um, a posture of heart towards his followers that was um, 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 amazing and unites us all together. So take it now. So uh, if, if the Sermon on the Mount is the greatest sermon of all time, which I think no reasonable person would say it's not, because it is, then the second greatest sermon of all time is in Deuteronomy. For, with um, uh, the person who was sitting, or who, who did s- sit at the, Je- at the seat that Jesus eventually sat at, the one who would give the law. Um, but it wasn't all law. So at the end, so Moses in Deuteronomy 30, at the end of his sermon said this. I'm going to read a little bit. This is in Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. This is not what you expect at this juncture in redemptive history, I don't think. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. But if your hearts turn away... And you will not hear, but you are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them. I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not long live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. So there are two ways to live your life, and there are two ways to live this week. This week you can boast in the fact that Christ is your friend, and that you're united to him, and that you are transformed from the inside out by what he's done for you. Or you can, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And um, I would not recommend the latter way. Have a good week. Bye.